Well, good evening, and welcome to Copernic Observatory and Science Center. Great to have uh, a nice group of people here uh, in, uh, in person. And we also uh, welcome those people watching on our live stream. Uh, my name is Drew Desker. I'm the director here at Copernic, and it's great, it's great having people back here uh, at Copernic. Um, we have an opportunity to learn a little bit about the moon tonight, but uh, generally, Copernic is really all about helping people understand how the world and how the universe works, and um, that's really our, our, our reason to be here. Um, we are a nonprofit. We're a, a, a pub public observatory. We're actually one of the probably best equipped public observatories literally in the Northeast, and um, but we, uh, again, being a nonprofit, we're actually... Uh, not actually uh, associated with any any uh, university or, or a government agency. So what keeps us going are people like you coming in the doors, buying memberships, uh, coming to uh, programs, uh, summer camps, that, uh, um, and as well as uh, programs that we'll do like on school, uh, school holidays, which Tish will talk about a little bit later. Um, as a matter of interest, um, who's here for the first time? Ooh. Wow, a nice, nice number. Okay. Uh, matter of interest, who's, who here has a Copernic membership? Oh, not as many as I'd like to see. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason I talk about that is that um, uh, Copernic uh, belongs to an association of uh, science centers called the ASTC, Association of, of uh, uh, Science and Technology Centers. And a Copernic membership actually gets you into... 350 other science centers. So if you like this kind of place, uh, a Copernic family membership is like $60 for the year, and you could get into uh, the Rochester Museum of Science. You could get into the Franklin Institute down in Philly, the uh, Intrepid Museum down in New York City, all for free. So um, again, if that's something that uh, appeals to you, I uh, uh, invite you to, uh, to, get, to get a membership. Uh, we always uh, let people know what's going on on our website. Um, if you're not already on our email distribution list, uh, you can go to our website and, and get on that, and you can learn about what's going on. Like next week, we'll have a, a um, actually a gentleman who grew up in this area, now lives in Houston, and is a mission controller for NASA at the Johnson Space Flight Center. So he's actually going to zoom in and talk about his experiences as a mission controller. Um, at uh, at Johnson, so that's going to be a, another great uh, uh, great event. And um, I mean, one of the nice things uh, that, that sort of come out of this you know uh, situation with COVID is that uh, you know back in March of, of uh, 2020 we had to stop doing public programs, so we pivoted and started doing live streams. We now have over 2,500 people subscribed to our live stream. Um, and doing some of our uh, sort of high-profile events, like back in December, we had uh, the uh, conjunction of uh, Jupiter and Saturn. We had over 4,000 people on our live stream, look, you know, watching um, uh, at that time. And, the, and the, the chat on the side was flying by like a CBS receipt. It was just wild. <laughs> but anyway, um, we're really glad that you're here tonight. I uh, hope uh, you got a chance to uh, learn a little bit with some of the family activities. Uh, Tish Brizzy is going to be uh, presenting um, uh, the moon to you, and um, we'll, um, if you haven't also gotten a chance to see it, we'll uh, we'll be uh, bringing in our, our lunar sample, our moon rock that's on loan from NASA. That's I believe will be part of your presentation. Somebody better be watching it right now. I'm gonna go find it. So uh, anyway, um, it's great to have you here. Um, great to have you uh, those watching on the on the live stream. And we'll just turn this over to Tish. Thank you. It's International Observe the Moon Night all over the world. And Copernic is one of the 500 places in America that is celebrating it. We've been doing this since 2010. Seems like forever, but not really. And you know what? A lot of the nights are rainy and ugly, but this one isn't bad. You know, it's warm out. At least we're going to go back out and try it again as many times as you want to tonight to see the moon. And I'm going to keep track of how many people put their eyes on the moon, especially through a telescope. But it doesn't have to be through a telescope. You can use binoculars. You can use your eyes. Um, some I, other way to see if, it. If I can interject, there is one rule what? about coming here to Copernic is you cannot leave 
until you look through a telescope. You gotta try. I will track you down. All right. <laughs> so make sure that uh, after the program you head out. Uh, we've got some scopes out in the yard. We'll have some scopes open in, uh, yeah. in the domes, and uh, definitely you have to you have to uh, look at the night sky through our scopes. Right, and you you just have to wear a mask, right, to get up on the platform. Uh, uh, if you're if you're outside, uh, outside you the masks are optional. Uh, in the domes, it's preferred. Uh, inside, it's mandatory. Okay. All right. Thanks, Drew. I've first, I've got a lot of people I want to thank for helping me out with this because NASA is just bombarding me with information, and um, I read everything. I save as much as I can, and I had huge folders, gigabytes of material, and I don't want you to think I'm going to throw it all at you tonight, but I am going to give you some resources, so if you've got your phone or any kind of connection with the world, please uh, feel free to try some of these sites because I know you're going to want to do more later, okay? Everybody loves the moon, right? We love it, even when you're eating Oreos and you forget about the moon, okay? So right now, I want to say thanks to Andrea Jones and Dr. Jones, not Indiana Jones. Dr. Jones works at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland, and she loves rocks. So you're going to see a lot of cool stuff about how do we know the things that we know about the moon, right? So um, this guy right here, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, that's a really big mouthful. It has been going around and around and around the moon and finally has finished taking pictures of every corner and every crater and every mare on the moon. And we now have the entire moon mapped out. And we have a great spot picked out to, for you to land. And um, 2024 was the first possible landing that might get bumped up a year because of COVID, but I'm still pretty optimistic. Um, I think the little people, though, in this room are going to think, you know how cool it was that all those celebrities were going up into the air and coming back down? Well, I think it's going to be just like that when they're big. It's going to be lots of people going up to the moon and back and up to the moon and back. It'll be really cool. We'll see how long it takes us to get there. I'll show you how. So thanks a lot, Andrea Jones. Let's see if my computer is going to work. Mm-hmm, sure. Yep. Yeah, I know. But, you know, there are some complications. Always. <laughs> yeah. I should be able to, yes. I've got so many gadgets, it's amazing. All right, so the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter is part of this team membership, and you've got to know there's a lot of people, but you know who it is? It's you. You pay your taxes, so you own NASA. It's yours. It's free. That's why all this stuff that we're giving out tonight, except for the cookies, no, I think... Probably, yes. Everything is going to be free after you pay your admission, of course. Let's try that. Ah, there we go. Um, this is the definition of what we're at tonight. The International Observe the Moon Night is a worldwide public celebration of the lunar sciences and exploration. One day each year, everyone on Earth is invited to observe, and it's always, always October first quarter moon. So here we are. People all over the world last year. These are pictures from last year, all over the world. I'll never forget the kid. Uh, there was a five-year-old boy who came up to me and said, how did you get the moon in there in the telescope? And I tried to explain it to him, and later on he got it. Now the Artemis program is is linked up to understanding the moon. First, why should we bother going there? 
Why should we bother living there? Well, here's a lot of reasons. Here they come. Artemis was the twin sister of Apollo and the goddess of the moon in Greek mythology. Now she personifies our path to the moon as the name of NASA's program to return astronauts to the lunar surface by 2024. When they land, Artemis astronauts will step foot where no human has ever been before, the South Pole, named for Ernest Shackleton. He was famous for discovering our South Pole, right? Look it up, Mr. Shackleton, yes. So the Shackleton Crater is something I'm going to really push on you, and we're going to find out why. There was a contest this year, and the winners of the contest are the Human Landing System Selections, Dianetics, SpaceX, and this team made up of the Blue Origin people, that's the guy from Amazon, yeah, okay. um, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and Draper, and those companies together made their own lander. Now all of these teams are ready to go. We just have to figure out a way to get people who want to go. So that's why there are so many humans going up and down and up and down to get used to it. So let's see what's going on next. This is the procedure that we hope to do. Artemis 1. You're going to go around the moon and come back, but you're not going to land. And there are no people scheduled for the Artemis 1. It's just going to be cargo doing the loop. Artemis 2 will have humans in it. Artemis 2 is just a year or two after, that's the plan anyway, and the people that are going on it will actually land, and there's expected to be a small group of people, including uh, the first woman, and why women have never been on the moon, I have no idea. But I lived in the 60s, and you know, people just didn't understand. And the confusion was obvious to me in that time. Um, the year after Artemis II, we're going to have uh, the Gateway started. The Gateway is a small space station going around the moon because they figure you've got to have a pit stop or a place to go in case the, land, the lunar surface becomes too dangerous. So a place that's less than a day away just to save your life, perhaps. But it could also be a landing place. The uh, gateway is going to be very useful. Um, the first landing of people in a group that are going to be staying there for a while. Now, uh, you might have gone to the Apollo 17 room. Did you go to the Apollo 17 room where the moon rock was? Did you see it? Okay, those people spent about seven hours at the most outside the capsule. Um, but they still were exhausted, and their suits didn't fit right, and there were a lot of problems with that. But at least they got a lot done. They, they brought home a lot of samples for us. We're very proud of that work. So um, this one right here. They're going to deliver the cargo first, like a little habitat that should inflate, we hope. And uh, the Artemis III crew will land right after that, and they'll take over the habitat. And it's meant for a few weeks at the minimum. So if you could spend a couple of weeks camping out in back of your mom and dad's house, you can pretend that you're on the moon. It would be really fun. That's the plan for Artemis uh, up to Artemis 3. Now, um, this is where I'd like to do a demonstration. And uh, can I walk over here? Okay. Well, okay. 
We're going to have to imagine something here. Okay, there you go. Thank you. All right. Um, how far away is the moon? That's a big question. And is it going to take us a long time? Does anybody know the answers to those questions? Some of us do. Okay, I got some. Okay, so if the Earth is 12 inches wide, let's look at the, use this for a scale, okay? Standard 12 inch globe. All right. How big would the space station be? Smaller than the end of your pinky nail. How far away would the space station be? 250 miles is about the width of your pinky, like that. That distance away, around and around. Now, using that for a pinky weight uh, length, Waiting. Ah, good. Okay. Back to pinkies. You got a pinky? Okay. 250 miles in this scale. Okay. So, how far would the moon be away from the Earth on this scale if the space station is one pinky away? Wait a minute. I need a moon. My grandson has one just like this. Um, it has terrible growths on it. I don't know what that is. There you go. Inverted craters. I love that. And it turned purple. So anyway, about one-fourth the size of the Earth. That's pretty close. How far away from the Earth would the moon be? Let me just give you a couple choices, okay? Here? Raise your hand if you think it's here. Yeah, I got one. Okay. Here? That looks like about six feet away. Two. Okay. How about here? All right. I measured this once. It's uh, about 12 feet. Here? Got more. Okay. 20. 20 feet away. Look at that earth way over there. Maybe that one? All right, here's the real one. Here we go. On this scale, with the earth being 12 inches wide, it's about this far away, which is um, <clears throat> 10 meters. 10 meters. So everybody look at the Earth. I'm seeing it from here. It's pretty far away. How long does it take to get there? Let's see. Somebody told me the three rule. I think you're, you're pretty close there, Mark. Let's start with the space station. three hours away on a good day. Getting to the space station in three hours is possible. Pinky? Okay. Um, to get to the moon? What do you think? Anyone? Go. You got it. Three days on a good day. A lot of times you have to do a couple of orbits. Get yourself moving and get used to it, and then, shh. but uh, you could get there in three days, yeah? So what about Mars? When it's on this side of the sun, yeah, it's pretty far. 
And that's only one part of the way because you've got to sit there and wait for it to come back around. So we say it's three years to go to Mars. All right. I'm back. Let's try this. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Drew. Okay. Now, um, actually, there's one more demo here with a pinky. I forgot. Okay, everybody pretend that the moon is over on this wall, okay? Well, sort of. Okay. That's the west. Okay. Put your pinky out and your arms straight all the way. One eye closed. This this pinky would cover the moon, even though it's a first quarter, even a full moon. And it's about half of a pinky. Because if you switch all the way around, that's 360 degrees, right? That's a half or one degree for the moon. One degree. Am I right, Art? Okay, half a pinky at arm's length. Now, one other thing you can remember with your hand, and that is if you go outside at 8.30 every night and look for the moon, Let's say you see it here one day, put your hand out, and you go back out the next day, 8.30, it's going to be your hand to the left, the width of your hand. It's why? Well, it's, it's what I'm going to show you right now. I'm going to sit down. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. One more. All right, so your hand comes in handy. Uh -huh. Okay. All right, don't forget to bring your pinky with you. Terrible jokes, awful. Okay, I need someone with the moon rock to come hither. Say hi to Gene Cernan. He got so dirty that day. This was his last day on the moon, December 1972. What were you doing in 1972? All right, I know some of you weren't born yet. <laughs> yeah. Gene Cernan, the last man on the moon, he was the commander. You see the red stripes on his pants and on his hat, helmet. All right. That's part of what, what helps you to recognize him in case you, they find your dead body, yes. But he's covered with dust, and when they went inside their little tiny capsule, they all recognized the smell of gunpowder. So somehow that dust has been pulverized for billions of years. Can't wait to show you how that works. All right, waiting for the moon rock to show up. Where is it? It better show up. Now, uh, I had to go to a class all summer at Goddard Space Flight Center, and Drew had to drive all the way down there to borrow that rock. It's up here already? Oh, the box is empty. <laughs> Is it in there? Oh, okay, great, okay. You know what it says on top of the box? If found, return to Johnson Space Center. Yeah, I, that would make me, I'd probably be at, I'd be in jail. Yeah, I'd be in really big trouble. Thank you. So um, the person who keeps keeps it under their pillow or watches it all the time, they have to promise to watch the rock from the moon because you know it belongs to the people of the earth and costs over $28 billion. Yes. Yep. Now, how did they get all those rocks? Well, let's find out. Uh, Apollo 17 is a fascinating group because it was the last. 
they examined this flat area called the Tortilla Flat, and there were two mountains on either side. Right about here. Wait, yes, no, here, right here. I'd like to thank George Normandon for this beautiful picture of the first quarter. Looks a lot like what we would have seen tonight, and there's still hope to see that. I hope we do. Thank you, Art. Yeah, that's a good point. So the moon takes 27.3 days to travel once around the Earth, and that's why it seems to move backwards sometimes. When you're seeing it each day, it goes to the left. The gravity is about one-sixth because it's about one-sixth the mass of the Earth. So if you go to the moon, you would divide your weight by six, and you would multiply your strength by six for a while anyway. I don't know how long it will last, but it will be fun at first. This, for this part of the program, I want to thank Noah Petro. Uh, isn't that cool? His name means rock. He's a rock expert at Goddard Space Flight Center. Thank you, Noah. He put this program together to show you the Apollo landing sites in order. Let's watch. <laughs> it could make you dizzy. Be careful. Apollo 12. Now, what happened to Apollo 13? They didn't land, did they? Oh, we have to a lot. Oh, we have to wait a long time. Yeah, there we go. Here's Apollo 14. I want you to look for a pattern. Where do you see all of these landings are? What part of the moon? Apollo 15. Hadley Rill. Apollo 16. Yeah, that's just what you guys were telling me that, yeah, there it is. Um, Copernicus Crater is almost on the um, Terminator. That's right. And the last one was Apollo 17 in 1972. Taurus Littrow. It's flashing up there. There it is. There it is. Oh, that was fun. Uh, Noah sent us on an excavation there. But notice the pattern. What do you see? They're all in the equator area. They had no choice but to, to land here. They wanted to land on a place that America could see, so they didn't go to the back of the moon. And they wanted to land in a place that they could predict had some smooth areas. Everybody knows the mare are the smoother areas, right? Yeah, although there are some, some of these landings were right in between mountains. So have you ever seen a supermoon? How does that work? How does it become a supermoon suddenly? Well, this is something that we have all noticed here at Copernic, and you would too if you watch it enough, but the moon's orbit is not round. And because it is halo-shaped, sometimes it's a little bit closer, and if it's closer, what does that tell you? It's going to look a little bigger, like if you're looking right in somebody's face, right? Okay. That's called perigee, and here's how you can remember it. Peri means danger. What's another word that sounds like peri? Peril or perilous, right. So that means the moon is closer at perigee. Look at the distance, 226,000 miles average. And when it's farthest away, Apogee, 252,000. So when it's farther away, it looks different. 
it looks smaller. We have a, a, a couple of uh, synthesizers that you'll be able to see how that works, just a moment. How many of you saw the uh, topography maps that were on the table in the lobby? Well, if you've missed it, you should check them out because they are brand new images of the whole surface of the moon. Remember, we're especially looking down here. Now, what color is the highest mountain? Anyone? It's the white, right. And then red after that. And the lowest places are purple and blue, right. Notice the far side of the moon is riddled with mountains and craters, while the near side, the one we see most of the time, unless we're traveling in space, are quite flat. OK. So what did we learn from all those rock expeditions? Well, if you take a close look at these rocks, these are samples, very tiny samples of lunar rock. Something you might notice is that there's an awful lot of crystals. Let's look at what they're called. Anorthosite, glass spherules, breccia, agglutinate, oh, that one's really melty, yes. Soil-coated basalt, that's lava, and feldspar breccia, and more basalt. All these, almost all of these were melted at one time. It tells us quite a bit. And what happens when it cools slowly? It makes bigger crystals. And it cools fast, it makes little crystals. So this is something we learn, and there's a whole meteorite section here at, um, well, actually, I'm not going to uh, offer this to you because I'm not sure if it's going to work, but this is Noah's idea of a website that might be worthy of checking out, um, meteorites.wustl.edu. Okay, let's go on. So if you could take a very thin slice of one of those rocks and look at it under um, a microscopic image, uh, a geo, geoscopic, is that what they call that? Um, it's especially for looking at rocks and thin slices of rocks. You will see that each color has its own spectrum, like platinum and titanium. Those two minerals are really expensive here on Earth, right? These are the kind of things like you use to make spacecraft and you use to make um, computers or jewelry. So they're very valuable, and that's the kind of thing that we're trying to reach out to the uh, private companies. And they're going to make lots of money by claiming areas on the moon that are rich in some of these minerals. OK, let's go to how the moon, we think, got its start. Uh, this is from Noah Petro. And this is a drawing of what we think it was like about 4.5 billion years ago. And a video clip that he put together, he'll see, take a look. The big blob is the Earth, and we got hit with something pretty big, almost the size of the, maybe bigger than the moon. And there are a couple of laws of, like, gravity that keep the particles close to the Earth. The Earth probably had a big uh, swarm of rings around it for a while. And after time, the moon formed. Didn't take very long, just a few million years. So let's see what he's got, the evidence.
This is the modern Earth. Oh, sorry, Moon. Yeah. And let's go to the next one. Okay. Um, our friends at the Goddard Space Flight Center have provided us with uh, a whole year's worth of what we call libration maps. And it's the moon and all the parts, and they're all going to go by very quickly. They added music to it, and we're going to take a look. Now, there are a lot of symbols here, so I'll try to explain some of them. This one's my famous favorite right here. These are the widths of the earth. I've got the sun in my pocket and the moon above my head. So, if it's a very low number, put the whole world at my feet and the pain, a cloud of It's very low. Now, why does it wobble like that? Well, it doesn't really change. It's just the angle that you're looking at it from the Earth, which is around here. Now, as the light of the sun goes by, you can see the name of the crater. Can you see Copernicus right here? There it is, right? Okay, back to this. Like the hand in a glove, like cherry pie and cream. There are stories we need to tell, and letters we need to share. There's joy and love all around, good vibrations everywhere. All right, so I'm going to move it to October. Uh, are there any supermoons coming? Let's find out. There's September. Oh, there's October. Let's go. Remember, it's going to be a super moon. Oh, it got to 28, but it was a new moon. Sorry. So you can see when there's a supermoon and when there is the regular moon, the epigee. We're used to that. But it's still gorgeous. Okay. I think the people at the uh, space um, video uh, area in uh, Goddard, they put music in there just to keep you excited about this. I think it's terrific. All right. Next one. Now, this is a serious video clip of the evolution of our moon. Watch up here in the corner so you can see the age at which things happened. Here we go. And, of course, it's based on the rock um, evidence.
You can download these videos at nasa.gov. We start with a squishy moon at four and a half billion years ago. A very powerful impact in the Aitken Basin near the South Pole. Then a period called the heavy bombardment. And it seems to be uh, evidence everywhere. All of the t uh, terrestrial planets have craters. Think about it. Why doesn't the Earth have a lot of craters? You got it. Lots of running water and air. So after about a billion years, three billion to one billion, little impacts every day. Sometimes you can catch an impact with your telescope and a camera. Just looks like a bright spot just for a moment. Do we expect meteorites to be a problem on the moon? Yes. No atmosphere to slow it down, right? So whatever you build your habitat from, it better be very strong. Maybe you'll even want to live underground. I was talking to Jeanette Epps one day, and she said something about training under a cave in in a cave to see if they could live in a cave on the moon. I really would love to see a, a local woman be a part of that first Artemis group. So what is this? Here's a quiz. What's that? Come on, you know. It's a, of course, it's an impact crater. And can you find the rim? Maybe you could live on the rim. That would be your sun. Lots of bright sunshine. By the way, the bright sunshine is about 220 degrees Fahrenheit. And the darkness is about minus 250 degrees. There is no happy medium on the moon. You have to make it yourself. Now in the center of almost every crater is an uplift. Let's look at this one. This mountain has a spot right there. Let's get closer. Now, both Noah and Andrea tell me that this rock is bigger than a baseball stadium. But they have no idea how it got to the top of that mountain. You'd think that if it hit really hard, it would have gone right down into the deepest part of that mountain. But no, that's an interesting puzzle. Maybe some of you young people could come up with some answers here. Uh, what are we looking at here? That word challenger reminds me of a space shuttle. But it's not the space shuttle that we're looking at here, is it? Definitely. If there are doubles, you see the doubles? That's a vehicle. That's the lunar rover. And if they're single, that's a person walking. And let's see where it says uh, astronaut footprints and the Challenger descent stage and the moon buggy track. Did you, did you catch any of the stories from uh, Apollo 17? Did you hear about the fender on the moon buggy? How um, Jack um, Schmidt broke the, the, 
what was it, the fender? Yeah, he broke the fender right off just by dropping a, a screwdriver on it. It must be really fragile when it's freezing cold or super hot. Maybe it's both at the same time. So they, they wrapped it up in duct tape and um, a, an old portfolio booklet and made a new fender because without the fender, the dust would come flying up in their faces and they would be able to see where they were going. That's what they said. If you go to that website I was talking about in the computer lab, it's got, um, let's see if I can remember the complete uh, address. It's uh, NASA Apollo 17 Image Journal. If you check it out, there's some stories in there of their day-to-day -day lives. It was tough. So what are we looking at here? What's this? Yeah, actually, it's a positive, believe it or not. It looks like a negative, doesn't it? But there's one perfectly round crater at the bottom of the moon. And do you know the name of it? I gave you a hint before. Named for Ernest Shackleton. Right, right. The, the Shackleton Crater is a place where we could possibly get 24-hour day sunshine around the rim and 24 hours a day frozen cheeseburgers or whatever you want to freeze down in that hole because that would be helpful too. Also, we found water on the moon. It's mostly frozen, and it's mostly at the bottom of the craters, but it's there. Some of it is 4 billion years old. I can't wait to see what that tastes like, you know? We're going to find out. Well, you know, when you're drinking water here on Earth, you're drinking dinosaur pee. It's practically the same thing. Um, Andrea Jones wanted you to know that there are the coldest places in the whole solar system on the moon. I thought maybe Pluto would be colder, but this is the coldest place they ever found right here. See the purple? And here? And this, this temperature is in Kelvin, but it's about 400 below zero or even colder in some of these areas on the, pol on the poles. Man, that's really cold. This is where I mention uh, girl power. Uh, our beautiful girl power class is coming up November 11th, and it's usually just for girls, but everybody's invited if you're grades 3 through 8. Um, you can learn about the moon and do activities and do crafts and uh, have a lot of fun working together. This is the lady that's going to be talking to us. Uh, Celia Barry is going to be talking to us from her. Um, this is like a, a field trip that she's on in um, Arizona. I think, or maybe, maybe it's New Mexico. I get those two mixed up. But she said that this is an old, ancient, uh, lava bed down there, and there used to be a volcano many, many years ago. I can I can recognize the black rock. It's probably basalt. And this looks very melty over here. Um, this vehicle is being tested for moon use. Um, it's going to be pretty fancy. I think it's going to be lovely. So Girl Power is November 11th, and that's a, a school holiday. Maybe the next Footprints on the Moon could be yours. And we're going to end with a song from Javier Colon and Matt Cousson, and they are recording this at um, the uh, New York City Museum. Uh, what's the name of that ship? Intrepid? The Intrepid. Uh, there's a uh, spacecraft parked there called the Enterprise. I don't know if I can control the volume on this. Okay. So that if you're talking, they can uh, they can hear you over it.
Robert Goddard had a birthday recently. What did he do? He invented the rocket. Although we give the Chinese credit for the little ones. Can you hear that okay? Have you ever been to the Intrepid in New York City? It's a huge ship full of lots of jets and uh, enterprises there. Did you put your eyes in that telescope? Yes? Okay. Great having you here. Thank you. You know, you don't have to fly to be a part of this. We need a lot of technology to get us there safely. Lockheed Martin is looking for people. That's where we use the topographic map. It's right out there. Um, it's not as high as you'd think. You know, uh, Mars has a 17-mile a high mountain called Olympus, and these are nowhere near that. Yeah. I have a feeling that when it did uh, solidify, the moon just settled right down, but there were so many impacts. Imp Puts. Anyway, impacts, sorry, that's the word I'm after. Impacts that uh, it was it was uh, making it very lumpy on the back, especially. Okay, so I just wanted to show you the, some of the women that are on, in line for being first. And, um, you know, they could surprise us and just not pick any of these ladies, but they're hopefully people with experience. This lady right here is Jeanette Epps from Syracuse. I hope she gets to go. Okay. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, the first woman comic book is interactive. You can use your phone and use the QR code, and you can animate the pages with your phone. So uh, type in first woman at nasa.gov. And you'll see something like this, and there'll be a download of a PDF that you can get. And it's really fun. So feel free to come on up and ask me questions. I'm going to turn off my mic now. Is that okay? Or should I keep it going?
No, that, that's fine. We can uh, we'll, we'll stop the live stream. But uh, if you have any uh, you're welcome questions, fine. If there were any questions in the um, uh, in the ch in the Zoom chat, uh, I mean the Zoom chat, the uh, YouTube chat, feel free to put them in here. But I, I don't see any. So uh, I thank you for watching on the live stream, and we will uh, transition there. The moon is out. So is Jupiter and uh, and Saturn. They uh, I have to say they're not great viewing, but um, uh, it's still worth uh, worth a shot. And definitely come up and check out the moon rock. Thanks.